Okay, we're going to look at some protocols for evaluating the extremities of the body. Uh, the first is going to be for suspected metastasis. So the patient has already had a diagnosis of cancer and now we're looking at uh, specific bone metastasis. And so that's going to be our indication, suspected bone metastasis. Uh, looking at the scanner settings, KBP is going to be 120 to 140. MA is going to be 130. Oral contrast, as we're looking at uh, long bones such as uh, the hands, uh, feet, humerus, and the femur, uh, all of these areas, uh, there's going to be no need for oil contrast. Uh, the phase of respiration is going to be at inspiration just so that we can uh, try and hold these areas of the body still. Uh, we're not, not going to worry too much about rotation time being 15 to 20 seconds, so don't worry too much about that. Uh, however, the acquisition slice thickness is going to be 2.5 to 1 millimeter. Uh, generally, we favor the 1 millimeter uh, slides simply. Uh, because they afford us the ability to recon in very small segments uh, versus 2.5 millimeter. Pitch is going to be 1.5. Uh, reconstruction slice thickness is 1.25 to 3. And uh, this is all depending on the area that you're scanning. If you're scanning in a very small area, uh, such as the hands and feet, uh, then potentially you will utilize the 1.25 uh, slices. If you're scanning on a large area, such as the femur, then typically three millimeters will be sufficient. Uh, the anatomic coverage is going to be several centimeters above and below the area in question. So as we saw before, this can range from a, a wide assortment of areas and so because of this uh, it can be anywhere just go several centimeters above and several centimeters below uh, just to make sure that you get this area in question IV contrast there's none uh, typically because we're going to be looking for bony lesions and notice that this is a very specific study uh, simply to exclude bone mets uh, if you're utilizing IV contrast, you're typically looking for soft tissue abnormalities. Uh, if so, if you're wanting to look at bone plus soft tissue uh, and you are wanting to use contrast, then you will use around 120, uh, even though this can be stepped down to uh, 100 if need be uh, due to the patient's uh, renal performance at two to three milliliters per second. I know this, um, this is simply for soft tissue. Okay, continuing on. Uh, the second study is gonna be for suspected osteo to osteoma. Uh, notice this osteo uh, means that we're looking still at the bones. Uh, KBP is going to be 120 and MA is going to be slightly stepped down to 90. Uh, oral contrast once again is none as there's no use for it. And the phase of respiration is quiet respiration or at full inspiration depending on the area to be scanned. Uh, depending on where you're actually looking for this, uh, if you're looking at, at the spine and you're looking at an area then definitely you would want full inspiration uh, but if you're looking at an extremity such as the femur uh, then quiet respiration would be uh, very much sufficient for this uh, once again we're not going to worry about rotation time notice the acquisition slice thickness is 1 to 1.25 uh, so we're, we're staying on the thinner side uh, pitch is 1.5 and uh, reconstruction slot thickness is 1 to, uh, we're going to say 1.25 as well. Uh, 
simply because we're basically mirroring what we're requiring, uh, but we typically want to stay on the thinner side. And the anatomic coverage is going to be at the region of the suspected lesion, wherever this might be. IV contrast is going to be none. And because we're looking at smaller slice thicknesses, such as 1 to 1.25, uh, this is called ultra high resolution spiral, and uh, it's typically used for small part scanning. Uh, typically, it's used for the wrist, but it can be utilized for other portions of the body. Uh, but it's typically used for focused examinations, meaning that you're not trying to scan this large area, but you're utilizing it for a very small region such as uh, looking for a bony lesion in the body. Uh, so typically that's why we're utilizing thin slices. So here we're looking for a possible muscle abscess, uh, just any abnormality with the muscle. So the KVP is going to be 120, uh, MA is going to be 165, uh, just due to the possible density uh, that we might be going through. Oral contrast is none because we're looking at virtually uh, any area of the body. Um, we typically want to utilize suspended respiration just so that we continue to hold uh, the area that we're looking for uh, as still as possible while we're doing this uh, we're going to use 2.5 millimeter scan uh, slice thickness at 1.5 for the pitch uh, this is going to allow us to acquire uh, quite a bit of data very rapidly and still have uh, the ability to reconstruct it in various planes uh, the reconstruction slice thickness is going to be 2.5 to 5 millimeter. Most of the time we tend to gravitate towards 5 millimeter unless we're utilizing uh, this for very small areas. The anatomic coverage is going to be above and below the abnormalities. Uh, this will be uh, pretty much told to you by the physician as to what you need to do. Uh, the IV contrast is going to be utilized here simply because uh, abscesses tend to show and demonstrate better when IV contrast is utilized. Uh, typically, uh, we, we liken this to appendicitis or, some, or something like that where there's an inflammatory process uh, and all the signs kind of point to this, uh, but you want to be sure. And so what uh, this IV contrast is going to allow you to do is demonstrate these areas to a much higher degree than possibly you would have before uh, just utilizing uh, no contrast at all. Uh, to ensure proper enhancement of the muscles, we're going to perform the scan 40 seconds after the initial start of the contrast. Uh, the key parameter to this is the differential enhancement of healthy muscle and abscess. Uh, we rely on the fact that healthy muscle appears one way and an abscess appears vastly different. And so this helps distinguish this. Without IV contrast, many abscesses would simply be missed because they would mirror what the muscle would look like or you would just never see it. But due to this density difference and changes in basically uh, the amount of vascularity, an abscess will really stand out. Uh, also, we need to utilize bone windows uh, just to exclude associated bowel involvement or osteomyelitis. And so you you want to verify that there is no other involvement um, even at, in, in various points of the body so you, you want to verify that this is simply in the muscle and not anything to do with the bone or uh, even in other portions of the body so definitely uh, do bone windows uh, if you haven't noticed pretty much all the scans that we talked about uh, or a high majority of them will utilize bone windows just so that we can see any other relevant anatomy and make sure that there's nothing going on with the bones that would be causing the patient symptoms. Okay, uh, the sternoclavicular or SC joint 
uh, to rule out an infection or osteomyelitis, uh, which, as we can see, is an inflammation process. Uh, scanner settings are going to be KBP uh, 120, MA is going to be 120, uh, oral contrast none, once again because we're utilizing uh, this scan to look for infections in this area. Uh, phase of respiration is going to be suspended at the end of inspiration. The acquisition of slice thickness, because we're dealing with a very small portion of the anatomy, is going to be 1 to 1.25. Uh, many scanners will even go down to um, 0.6 millimeters, and this would be adequate as well, simply because you're wanting to get the most resolution at, that you can uh, so that you can demonstrate any certain points of the anatomy. Uh, pitch is going to be 1.5 yet again, uh, and Reconstructed slice thickness is going to pretty much mirror our acquisition slice thickness. Now the anatomic coverage is going to be above and below the joint space. So, so if uh, this is the clavicle or bilaterally, and this is the manubrium and here is the SC joint you want to scan from here to here uh, simply so that you get all of this area uh, the IB contrast is going to be utilized yet again because we're looking at an inflammatory process which is going to have a certain degree of vascularity uh, that needs to be demonstrated uh, it's going to be at 100 milliliters at 2 to 3 milliliters per second and uh, we're going to scan about 50 seconds after the initial start of the injector uh, just simply to best demonstrate this anatomy. And basically, uh, this protocol is uh, labeled an ultra high resolution, yet again, simply because we're using the small slice thickness and we're recalling in it so that we can see the various portions of the small anatomy. Uh, also, it is essential to notice that obliques uh, are often useful in these cases uh, simply because uh, the sternum is not, a, or the clavicle is not a flat bone. And so, uh, to best demonstrate the SC joint, uh, it's going to be essential that uh, you do a slight oblique so that you can put it in perspective so that you can see see this joint space uh, to a higher degree. Okay, uh, this is trauma to the shoulder joint. Uh, anytime that you might have uh, some abnormalities to potentially the glenoid phosphor, the humeral head, a uh, fracture just below that, or even the scapula or the clavicle can all be attributed to this because they all comprise the shoulder joint. And so this includes the sternoclavicular and the chromioclavicular joints as well. Uh, settings are going to be KBP 120 to 140 and MA is going to be 120. Uh, oral contrast is not going to be required for this. Uh, due to where you're going to be scanning uh, and the high probability of motion if respiration is continued, uh, definitely want to suspend inspiration or suspend respiration at inspiration. Uh, slice thickness because you're dealing with very small portions of anatomy as well. Uh, you want to utilize thinner slices if possible. Uh, 1.25 in, in my opinion would be the maximum that I would want to go. However, the book says that you can go up to 2.5. Uh, but if your scanner will go lower, I know many scanners will go 0 0.7, 0 0.75 uh, to 0 0.6. Uh, and so uh, definitely utilize the smaller settings if at all possible. A uh, pitch yet again is 1.5. And we're going to recon in the small slice thicknesses as well, utilizing uh, 1.25 if at all possible. 
uh, 2.5 would actually be sufficient for this because if once you've acquired the data you can always go back if uh, this is too large of a slice thickness you can always go back and uh, kind of minimize it to a certain degree uh, anatomic coverage is going to be several centimeters above to several centimeters below the shoulder joint so uh, you definitely want to scan above the chromium uh, so that you get the AC joint and if, if you're looking for uh, the scapula in its entirety uh, you need to scan even below the scapula by a couple of centimeters uh, to wherever this possible fracture or abnormality is uh, that's the thing about uh, most of these extremities is that you're kind of at the leeway to scan where you feel you have to scan to uh, so there's really no certain point you just need to scan several centimeters below uh, where where the abnormality is IV contrast is not utilized here because we're typically looking for a fracture or some abnormality like that there's been some trauma to it uh, so IV contrast most of the time would uh, be kind of detrimental because it's going to require a, a greater amount of effort to get the same results. The IV contrast is not going to highlight any certain points of anatomy and it's going to require us waiting on lab results to come back, uh, getting the patient uh, stuck and then actually injecting the contrast in. And so this can all be very detrimental to the speed in which this needs to progress. Uh, volume rendering is going to be very useful. Uh, we all know volume rendering is a 3D display. Uh, one thing that I would like to caution you though on volume rendering is the fact that if you utilize it and you remove too much of the bone, uh, many times you can degrade the amount of image uh, or you can degrade the image quality that you have. Uh, and one thing that I've really noticed about volume rendering, uh, although it may not be like this on all scanners, is the fact that if you don't have uh, great bone density, volume rendering tends to look um, pretty sloppy uh, simply because you kind of burn through or there's not enough data for these points. Also, uh, three millimeter thick sections uh, reconstructed by one or two millimeters is also satisfactory less cooperative patients and so what we're talking about here is that uh, if you have to acquire uh, at like two millimeters you can even go up to three if you have to uh, just simply to get the patient scanned uh, if they're less cooperative and we all have had those patients where you just really can't do anything about them um, I, I remember uh, having a patient and having to do a shoulder uh, CT on her uh, who had Parkinson's and was having tremors and it was it was very uh, very difficult to get the, the scan acquired because she was having her tremors and her arm would shake and she had no control over it she couldn't help the fact that she was shaking she, she did all she could uh, but you have to get creative in how to get this patient scanned uh, without any motion or with as much reduced motion as you can possibly have. And so one of the ways that we can do this is by bumping up our um, slice thickness or we can also adjust our pitch. We can kind of balloon our pitch out to um, maybe a two. Uh, but the problem with ballooning your pitch out is the fact that you're probably going to decrease your image quality to a certain extent. You're going to speed the scan up, but your image quality is going to have a bit more noise. And so it's at these moments where you have to decide whether it's actually adequate to do this or not. The wrist and hand uh, is going to be something that uh, you may or may not see a lot of depending on uh, how prevalent these orders are and how uh, how much uh, the physicians in your area actually favor these orders. Uh, some do more than others. But in looking at the wrist and hand, the instant thing that we uh, kind of recognize is that we're dealing with very small portions of anatomy, very small bones um, that are going to require 
an efficient technique. And this is simply to rule out a fracture or dislocation. Uh, usually you're not going to do this uh, very often simply for a fracture because of the fact that many times conventional radiography is still an excellent uh, substitute for CT in this, uh, yielding much lower dosage and allowing you to see displacement as well. But if there's some uh, worry that potentially there's an artery in question, uh, that the fracture could be compromising, uh, lack of pulse, things like that, uh, this can all be utilized there. Uh, KBP is going to be 120 and MA is going to be 100 to 160. Uh, MA is probably going to trend on the lower side, closer to the 100 and the 160, uh, but that all is kind of dependent on the patient. Oral contrast is not going to help us here, so we won't even consider using it. A phase of respiration is not going to be utilized either. Uh, the rotation time, we're not going to worry about either. Uh, the acquisition slice thickness is something that we do need to consider, uh, and we need to go potentially with as low of settings that our scanner will allow us to utilize. Uh, for some it's 0 0.5, for others it's 0 0.6, uh, but no more than one millimeter. Uh, just simply because of the fact that we're dealing with very, very small anatomy. Uh, pitch is 1.5. However, uh, the pitch could even be brought down to 1 if you're worried about resolution and you want to decrease the noise. However, a pitch of 1 is going to yield slightly higher dosage uh, due to uh, the fact that you're uh, not moving as much with one rotation. Uh, also notice that reconstruction uh, slice thickness is going to be uh, 1 to 1.25. We're going to stay on the small end on this. Uh, however, if we've got a large area to cover, 1.25 would be adequate as well so that we don't uh, kind of bog down the pack system uh, and make it very laborious uh, to look at the images to even see if there's anything wrong with the patient. Uh, anatomic coverage is going to be the entire wrist and hand. Uh, including the proximal radius and ulna. So uh, notice we're doing a combination scan of wrist and hand. So uh, you definitely want to get all of the wrist and all of the hand. Uh, another thing that the book that I that I got this from it doesn't really kind of tell you, uh, but every department has their way of scanning extremities and scanning uh, hands and wrist. Uh, it seems like hands and wrist are going to be those that are the most difficult to kind of figure out how to best effectively do it because no matter how you try and scan it uh, it's going to be a little awkward for the patient. Uh, typically what we utilize is the patient laying prone on their stomach uh, with their head towards the gantry and their arms extended and their hands extended as well uh, and uh, many times we'll put some, a divider in between uh, so that we can uh, cause the most appropriate separation of the hands that we can keep them at a, a certain level. Uh, typically when you're utilizing a, a scan like this, you're doing both hands and both wrists uh, so that the radiologist will have something to compare it to uh, and also uh, see if there's any inflammation uh, in one side versus the other. And so uh, typically we want to do bilateral extremities, not just one. Also uh, notice that because we're looking at a fracture, uh, IV contrast is not utilized. Uh, however, I, will, I would like to say that if you were looking for a soft tissue abnormality, uh, many times IV contrast will be utilized. Um, and uh, you can use probably 100 at 2 milliliters per second and do about a 50 second delay. Uh, also notice that this uses the bone algorithm which is critical for small part anatomy. You definitely want to utilize the bone algorithm but also uh, you want to utilize a soft tissue reconstruction method as well uh, so that you can see if there's any degree of inflammation in this area associated with the pathological fracture. 
Uh, one thing to notice is the positioning of the wrist is less critical when 0.5 millimeter slices are used. And that's just simply because you're able to see uh, virtually everything with 0.5 millimeter slices. Uh, as you increase the amount of slices, it becomes very critical to uh, have the wrist positioned in a correct fashion. But that's why we tend to stay on the small side of the slices, so that we eliminate any discrepancy that might be caused by our positioning. I'm sure that we each have saw uh, pelvic trauma and there'd be some degree of question if uh, the acetabulum was still intact. Uh, and so this is what this is going to be for, an acetabular fracture. A KVP is going to be 120 to 140. I notice our MA is going to go up simply because we're going through a very dense bony portion uh, and that's going to be 200 to 250. Oral contrast is not going to be utilized. Uh, the phase of respiration is going to be suspended respiration due to the fact that uh, breathing, uh, even though you're going through a very, very uh, shallow portion probably of the patient's anatomy, uh, you still don't want to have any kind of motion if you can help it because it could obscure or make there be a fracture where there is nothing or make it look like no fracture when there is. Uh, slice thickness is going to be 1.25 and we're going to recon this in 1.25 as well. Uh, pitch is going to be 1.5 as it has been for pretty much all of the scans that we've looked at uh, in this lecture. Uh, the thing that you're going to be covering is the acetabulum. You want general rule is it, here is the acetabulum. And I know the, the femur looks very, very horrible here, uh, but this is a crude drawing. You want to go above the acetabulum and below the acetabulum so that you pretty much see if there's any kind of abnormalities there. Uh, also, IV contrast may be used for uh, an angiogram, uh, but in this case it's not going to be utilized because you're looking for a fracture. Uh, you, you definitely want to be able to see the fracture if there is uh, anything going on with the acetabular fossa. In many cases uh, of isolated pelvic injury, a non-contrast study is satisfactory. However, if the possibility of a vascular or bladder injury is suspected, then the protocol should be done with IV contrast and a CT angiogram can also be done. Uh, so if there's any question, if the patient has some abnormality to the bladder uh, or uh, anything like that uh, in the lower portion, uh, then you can inject contrast. But this is going to be at the discretion of the ER physician or the physician that is ordering this. Uh, also, it's important to note that a CT angiogram can be done using the same scan settings, uh, just only injecting, but uh, typically not going to be. Okay, this is a knee CT, uh, and you'll notice that the knees are not as common as other portions simply because uh, if you're looking at uh, ACL, uh, PCL, uh, things like this, as well as the bony anatomy. And so because of this, MRI does a, a, an excellent job of demonstrating the knee, both bony anatomy and um, all the ligaments and tendons. And so typically an MRI is going to be utilized. However, if you're at a facility that does not have MRI, uh, then CT becomes your best option here uh, to demonstrate any kind of anatomy. Uh, so this is going to be the result of trauma and uh, this can take various degrees uh, if there's uh, potential ligamental damage or if there's bony damage uh, this will hopefully demonstrate it. A uh, KVP is going to be 120 to 140. Uh, MA is going to be uh, probably around what we saw for the pelvis at probably 200 to 250. 
uh, even though you're going through a very uh, thinner portion of the anatomy, uh, steel is going to be very dense in bone. Oral contrast is going to not be utilized because we're not even close to the bowel. Phaser respiration is not going to be important on this as well simply because you're far enough away that the patient's respiration should not cause any abnormality with the knee. The acquisition slice thickness is going to be 1.0 to 1.25. We're still going to favor on the smaller side, 1.0, uh, just to be on the safe side of demonstrating any abnormality with the trabecula of the bone. Uh, pitch, if we'll notice here, is 0 0.75, meaning that uh, the table is not moving as much as what what is being scanned. So you're going to have a slight degree of overlap, and you're going to have radiation dosage increase. Uh, however, this is going to provide a higher degree of resolution and decreased noise. If you are worried about the patient dosage, uh, if the dosage is becoming a very large concern here because the patient's had multiple scans and things like that during the same uh, same period of time, uh, then you can raise the pitch up uh, to one, and but just bear that in mind that uh, you're going to have an increased association with noise. Uh, the reconstruction slice thickness is going to be pretty much a mirror of the acquisition slice thickness. Um, however, we can go up to 1.25, and I would even say that we can go up to 2.5 uh, and be still adequate for this because you can always go back to your ones if you have to. Uh, basically, you're going to have the area covered above and below the knee. Uh, so you want all the knee joint, uh, and you definitely want above and below, just to verify that there's no abnormalities there. Uh, especially if what the patient's going in for is, uh, or they have a fracture, uh, and it extends up uh, past the knee joint, uh, you definitely want to be able to get that. Uh, no IV contrast, because we're not looking for an inflammation, we're looking for a bony abnormality. Uh, also notice that overscanning with the 0 0.75 improves volumetric data set, uh, but you do this at an increased dosage. And so once again, if you want to decrease your dosage, you elevate your pitch up slightly, uh, but just know that there there is always trade-offs for anything that you do. So if you have a lower pitch, I think you're going to have a higher dosage, but if you have a higher pitch, you're going to have lower dosage, but more noise. This brings us to the foot. Uh, the foot is another one of those instances where uh, you possibly might not see a lot of these uh, for the for the fact that MRI does a better job of demonstrating the ligaments uh, and even bony anatomy in this sense. However, if CT is going to be utilized, it's going to be usually for uh, pain or coalition anything like this that could cause high abnormalities of the foot. A KBP is going to be 120 to 140 and MA is going to be 90 to 110. Notice we drop our MA simply because we're going through a very very small portion uh, of the body and so not a lot of penetrating power is going to be needed. Oral contrast is going to be none and the respiration is not going to matter at all either. Acquisition slice thickness is going to be 1.0 to 1.25, and we're going to reconstruct it at this interval as well because we're dealing with such a small portion of the anatomy. A pitch is 1.5. Uh, the real key here is the anatomic coverage. Uh, the entire foot beginning slightly above the ankle, and so you want to begin above the ankle and go all the way through the foot. Uh, the question then becomes. How do you actually scan the patient? Uh, do you scan the patient with their knees bent and their feet flat, or do you keep their knees straight and uh, have them uh, kind of flex their foot up towards their head? Uh, we typically utilize the, the latter process where the patient has their knees bent, uh, knees straight, and their foot kind of flex back. And the reason for this is because if you have their knees bent and their feet flat as you're scanning through, uh, then what happens is that the ankle joint is not entirely visualized correctly. And so there is some angulation effect there. 
but if you have the patient laying supine with their knees straight and their foot kind of flexed back in just a normal position, uh, then you can instantly see both the ankle and the foot uh, in a higher degree. So we typically favor that. Uh, IV contrast is going to be none. Uh, and the thing that we need to keep in mind is that this protocol also uses the same high resolution algorithm designed for better bone detail. So we're utilizing smaller, lower slice thicknesses. Uh, NPR and or volume rendering are both useful in these cases, um, but be very cautious in volume rendering simply because if the patient is uh, uh, in advanced age, then you might not get as accurate imaging. Um, NPRs are usually the better choice in this instance. Also, two different positions may be needed unless isotropic data sets are acquired. And so basically what you can do is exit that line, uh, exit that line out uh, because uh, with our new scanners we have the ability to recon any of the planes and do obliques and all of these things so uh, there's not going to be really two data sets needed uh, but I will say that just like the hands and the wrist you want to scan both feet so that they can be compared against the other and the same goes for the knee as well that you're going to use, that you're going to scan both knees bilaterally just so that the radiologist will have something to compare one to the other with So that brings us now to angiography. And so um, this is one of those fields that is gaining a, a lot of attention in CT uh, because of the fact that we have the ability to acquire a very long stream of data very rapidly and demonstrate blood flow uh, to a, a very high degree. And one of the things that's kind of really catching on is uh, cerebral angiography. And so uh, this is typically used for an intracranial aneurysm, uh, arteriovenous malformation or an AVM, or an arterial thrombosis. And so uh, all of these things can be utilized with this. Uh, the patient is going to be laid supine with their arms by their side, uh, head in the headrest, and maybe even a head restraint if at all possible. Uh, the key thing to remember is to remove all dental prosthesis. Uh, the anatomical range is going to be from the skull base to the vertex, so you want to get all of the skull in there. So it's uh, virtually the same amount of, that, of anatomy acquired as you would with a typical uh, CT head. Uh, the patient is not going to have any respiratory instructions, uh, but we are going to utilize contrast. And notice we're going to use 100 milliliters at 3 milliliters per second so that we get an adequate bolus and a flush here. Uh, image timing is going to be 40 seconds. Uh, however, uh, many times we utilize bolus timing software so that we can ensure that we get a consistent scan uh, protocol each and every time. The only problem with bolus timing software is you're at the discretion if the patient moves. Uh, and that's one of the big detriments of it is if you plan it out and utilize and you stick the bolus software in an area and the patient does move uh, then it can cause very very poor scans uh, so that's something that you need to keep in mind with this uh, the collimation is going to be 64 by 0 0.6 millimeters uh, so your slice thickness acquired is going to be 0 0.6 millimeter uh, pitch is going to be one and the important thing to remember is that NPRs and MIPs and volume rendering uh, are all going to be utilized and going to be useful here. They all have their benefits, uh, but the goal is to demonstrate uh, the arteries and uh, veins that are inside the brain. And so that's that's our ultimate goal here. And uh, the thing to keep in mind is you need to perform a routine head protocol first. Uh, never do an injection in for the head without utilizing a without scan first uh, because as we saw before if you don't utilize without head uh, scan then you you could be just injecting contrast that is going to uh, 
cause increased intracranial pressure, which is something you do not want to do. So always do it without first. So this is a venous sinus angiography. So we're looking at the venous aspect of angiography uh, for the, the cranium. And this is for a suspected thrombosis of venous sinus or large cerebral veins. And so basically you're looking for a thrombus inside the brain. A uh, patient is going to be supine with their arms by their side. Uh, their head is going to be in uh, the head uh, restraint in that we're scanning from the skull base to the vertex. No respiratory instruction be 0.6 by 64 and pitch is going to be 1. As we saw with the previous, uh, a routine head without should be done first. Uh, NPRs and MIPs will be essential to demonstrating all, all different types of venous anatomy. And this technique is probably not capable of detecting or excluding the cavernous sinus or cephalic vein thrombus. So there is some limitations to this and or its branches. And so basically, uh, we're looking at how we can improve uh, doing the carotid angiography and uh, trying to approach the actor that at the sternal launch you're going to get uh, from the aortic arch up. Uh, patient respiratory instructions is going to be in a breath hold and inspiration and the reason for this is because the scan is going to go very rapid and uh, it's not going to be a very long breath hold uh, at all. You can best determine when to scan the patient and so it relies on an enhancement of the contrast and because of that uh, basically once it reaches this certain density the computer tells the scanner to begin scanning. Uh, uh, one of the carotid arteries, or uh, I know a lot of, lot of patients uh, typically put it at the aortic arc, uh, somewhere around there, so that you can pretty much time it when it, you can, you can set a delay so that you can be sure that the carotids are, uh, the carotid arteries as they ascend up the neck, it just kind of goes over it again. Uh, and this is for the detection or exclusion of pulmonary emboli. And uh, it's going to be one of those routine common exams. Uh, usually uh, it's entirely dependent on the patient's D-dimer. If the patient has an elevated D-dimer with um, a moderate amount of breathing difficulty, uh, then uh, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to be doing a pulmonary embolism study or a pulmonary angiography. And so the key to this is that it is uh, effusion or uh, potentially uh, lung C8, uh, things like that. So you definitely want to scan through the entire lung fields because while you've got the patient on the table, it's going to be essential that you minimize the dosage. And one way that we can do this is scanning. Uh, the respiratory instructions is going to be breath hold and inspiration to keep this anatomy stationary uh, as best we can, uh, even though the heart has motion, uh, and to some degree this will be obscured. Uh, the contrast enhancement is going to be 100 milliliters at 3 milliliters per second. We have the right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery. Uh, we have this pure vena cava and it can cause a scattering or a scattering effect. Uh, the scanner can actually get triggered by this pure vena cava. And so typically what I like to do is put the locator inside of the left pulmonary artery so that we uh, are kind of removed from anything that could cause the scanner to go off without it reaching the maximum amount of density that it's required to. Uh, so uh, I've, I've had uh, fine, but it's going to be uh, one of those areas that's going to be kind of detrimental um, to complete accuracy of the scan. Collimation is going to be 64 by 0 0.6, and the pitch is going to be 1. 
uh, NPRs and MIPs are going to both be helpful and to uh, provide the patient with the best scan that we can possibly do. And so uh, it's, it's up to you and your facility where you put the locator, uh, but from my experiences I've had uh, a better image quality by placing it in the left pulmonary artery. Coronary arteriography is gaining uh, some degree of prevalence. Comical range is going to be above the tracheal bifurcation to below the diaphragm so that you get the heart in its entirety. Uh, the patient respiratory instructions are uh, basically um, your arteries. And the scan is to commence around 10 seconds after the start of the, new, uh, at the, start of the second phase. And so uh, basically you're going to have 60 milliliters injected at this point in time. Uh, the collimation is going to be 64 by 0 0.6 and the pitch is going to be 1. Uh, important comments about this or utilized. And so you can use beta blockers to hopefully slow down the heart rate. Uh, use test bolus to, to basically establish timing and, M and MIPs and volume rendering techniques that relies in such a high degree. And that's because while you're in checking out how much stenosis there is, you can also utilize invasive procedures and remedy it while you're in CT, just because of the rapidity in which it can be accomplished. So aortography, uh, as the name implies, is going to be a study of the aorta. And so this is going to include detection and exclusion of aortic aneurysms, dissections, bleedings, uh, thrombosis of the ascending aorta, aortic arch, or descending thoracic aorta. So any abnormality for the aorta is going to be detailed here. And so as you can guess, this is going to be uh, a fairly decent or, or a fairly lengthy scan, uh, depending on how far you want to go with the aorta. Uh, the patient is going to be positioned supine and uh, look at the abdominal at after the, the start of the injection, uh, but the most effective means is using the bolus timing software. Uh, the aorta is very easy to pretty much uh, find and uh, it's very easy to put a locator in it, so uh, not a lot of work there to actually get that uh, to where you can have a consistent result. So most of the time, bolus timing software is utilized and the tracker is placed inside the aorta. Or um, the descending aorta to the ascending aorta. And the method behind the aorta where you want it to. So this way ensures it to a higher degree. So this is abdominal aortography, and so basically this is just a continuation of uh, the aortography or the thoracic aortography. Uh, the patient is still going to be supine with their arms extended above the head. Uh, the anatomical range is going to be above the diaphragm to the symphysis pubis. So we're breathing uh, so that you don't cause uh, significant abnormalities here. Uh, the contrast enhancement is going to be uh, 120 milliliters, 30 milliliters per second. And notice we're still utilizing uh, the bolus tracking software. I want to add that if you want to combine the abdominal aortography and the thoracic aortography, which we just previously seen, uh, you can pretty much combine both scans. 64 by 0 0.6 and pitch is going to be 1. Uh, with a 64 slice machine, and this is supposed to be Uh, coverage of thoracic and abdominal aorta in one sweep with a single breath hold is easily achieved. Um, so that brings us to peripheral angiography. Uh, and this is for peripheral vascular disease. Uh, and so basically, uh, we've all heard of uh, PAD. Uh, 
peripheral artery disease, uh, things like that. And this is what we're evaluating for. A runoff series. And so basically because you're scanning a very large portion of anatomy, uh, the patient's not going to be required to hold their breath, uh, but we are going to be utilizing uh, contrast at 120 milliliters at 3 milliliters per second. Uh, the timing is, is going to be imperative. Uh, many times bolus tracking software is going to be used, uh, placed in the aorta at 25 to 30 seconds uh, after the initial start of injection. Uh, the collimation is going to be 64 by 0 0.6 and the pitch is going to be 1. However, notice a unilateral stenosis may pose timing problems. So if there's a high degree of stenosis uh, in the patient, uh, then, uh, feel free to just give me an email at tmassengill0002 at kctcs.edu.